The flavour of the day is strawberry. Oh, and there's a postscript as well. Just so you know. Right then, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is, wherever you are, and whatever time of day it happens to be, if that makes possible sense. At any rate, my name is Paul, I'm also called Knickknack, I'm the man in charge of Knickknack's Old Peculiar, the world's most repetitive blog, I'm also the man in charge of this here YouTube channel that you're watching this on, at MrCuddy2977, please, if you could feel free to hit like and subscribe, you will see, hopefully, all sorts of fascinating content, including the daily teasers, including a few movie reviews, and of course including a few TV re reviews as well. For the past three weeks, I've been watching classic Doctor Who series, The Crusades, and I'm watching the last one on Friday the... Let me double-check my dates here. Friday the 10th, and we'll have my written review of it up on Saturday the 11th. You are welcome to read or watch that as and when the time comes. Today is Monday the 6th of February, it's 2023, and of course last night was Sunday when I watched the first episode of Series 3 of Apple TV Plus's For All Mankind, and I wanted to tell you about the episode. <laughs> Episode 1, Polaris, opens with a summary of this version of history, showing us what's happened in the decade since Series 2. It reminds us that Gary Hart ran for and won the presidency, that Ellen Wilson, Jody Balfour, is a candidate in 1992 and running against Bill Clinton, and that the Beatles, as John Lennon didn't die in this version of history, played a reunion concert. It also tells us that Danny Stevens... Casey W. Johnson, who is son of NASA heroes Gordo and Tracy Stevens, is now a NASA astronaut after their deaths and achieving sobriety for himself. The scene shifts to show us Karen Baldwin, Chantel Van Satten, who is now divorced from Ed, John Kinnaman, and it shows us that she is now running the Polaris, a very posh, very exclusive hotel that's hosting some prestigious guests in low Earth orbit. The hotel is also hosting the wedding of none other than Dan Danny Stevens himself and of Amber, Madeline Batani, his right to be. Something that Karen and Sam, Jeff Hefner, her business partner, believe can only do the Polaris good. There are very important guests coming who can speak well of the place, assuming the wedding and their stay is faultless. Back on Earth, NASA headquarters is just waking up, as is NASA's head, Margot Madison, Rain Schmidt, a woman who's waking up to pressure. She is getting pushed by all and sundry about who is to pilot NASA's upcoming first expedition to Mars. She's getting no help from Molly Cobb, Sonny Walger, the head of NASA's astronaut program. Margot prefers the calmer Daniel Poole, Chris Marshall, but Molly prefers the risk taker, Ed Baldwin, He's currently both of whom are currently on the Polaris. The situation is getting urgent as the Soviet Union has announced its plans to get to Mars by 1996 and announced its pilot in the process. Meanwhile, both Ed and Danielle, with their respective partners, are on the Polaris for Danny Stevens' wedding to Amber. But what Ed, Danielle, Karen and Sam and the blushing bride and groom don't know, is what NASA's just told Polaris commanders Laporte, Derek Webster, about a rocket, a North Korean rocket, a North Korean rocket that's exploded in orbit, and that there's wreckage flying about everywhere in that part of Earth orbit, wreckage that could very easily damage a passing space hotel. <laughs> Now, what did I make of this opening episode of Series 3 for All Mankind? Was it, as I always ask in these circumstances, good, bad, indifferent? Did I notice anything? Did I notice the Earth moving round as the Polaris orbited? Did I notice the Polaris itself? Did I notice, ha, the look of the thing, 
and the design of that set. Some time ago, I saw a pair of films, Jordan Peele's Nope and Ben Wheatley's In the Earth, and walked away from both films convinced that both directors were fans of Stanley Kubrick. Peele's colour palette and use of intertitles in Nope got me looking at his Wikipedia page. Wheatley's In the Earth is basically a horror film with a psychedelic ending and a great big black menacing monolith. Blatant is possibly not the word. So watching Polaris was uncanny again, and we can see Kubrick's influence, I think. The Polaris station itself reminded me of the space station in 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's a giant wheel in space with four spokes, northwest, east and south, around a central hub, and this station is ro rotating to provide gravity to the wheel part. The interior is a great big curved set. Um, and that's just on the Polaris. 2001, it's exactly the same. For my money, the one clearly influenced the other. And I think someone in the For All Mankind design team is a 2001 fan. Or at least they've seen it and thought, yeah, that's what we're going to make the Polaris look like. And given that, given how the Polaris interior looked, in particular the interior, with those curved corridors, I was, I'll be honest, I was half expecting Leonard Rosser to turn up at some point and start talking Russian. But in all seriousness, though, it is, despite the influences being obvious, it's a well-designed set, and it's a well-designed episode. And that's something I think Apple, with its two science fiction series I've seen, because Foundation's the other one they seem to be running, the actual design work is very good. It's unsurprising, it's Apple, and they do have a reputation for very good design work. Just don't ask about the settings in Venturi. Cast-wise and plot-wise. Cast-wise, Polaris is great. It's reintroduced us very gently to the series' regulars. Ed, Danielle, Karen, Margot and Molly. Played by, respectively, Chris Kinnaman, Chris Marshall, uh, Chantel Van Zanten, and Rainy Schmidt and Sonia Wolga are all back and have their scenes in this particular episode. Molly, it has to be said... Um, played by Sonia Walger, is a particular favourite character. So seeing her scene with Margot, with Margot being persistently growled at by Molly, Molly's guide dog, is both welcome. It tells us Molly might be missing her sight, but she's not missing anything else. It's welcome. It's also very funny. <clears throat> it also hints at new characters who we don't see too much of in this episode. But we also see recast versions of younger characters, characters who've been children in the first two series. Casey W. Johnson, as the older version of Danny Stevens, was one of the central points of this episode. Plot-wise, Polaris is an incredibly thrilling, thrilling piece of work, with a malfunctioning thruster forcing the Polaris to spin faster and faster, and forcing the ship's artificial gravity it's what they call centripetal, I think. It's basically centrifugal force acts as gravity. The gravity gets higher and higher and higher and gives the people on board the Polaris less and less time to get off the ship via shipboard elevators that are ruined by the malfunctioning thruster. Those elevators have basically <laughs> gone splat bang into the central hub and been ruined as they've hit the ground at quite a high speed. Frankly, Polaris is a riveting watch. It is exciting, it is tense, it is a fantastic opening episode, an exciting introduction for those who've not seen the series so far, and I suspect a good, end, good introduction to the series as a whole for people who've not seen it. I also think that fans of the show aren't going to be disappointed either. It's a great little season opener. Hopefully, They'll 
maintain the pace of it throughout. With all of that said, I am going to be watching more of this series of For All Mankind, and I will be watching episode 2, Game Changer, on Sunday the 12th of February, and will have my written and video reviews of the episode up on Monday the 13th of February. Now, I don't know if you'll be back for next week, and I don't know if you're watching my reviews of the classic Doctor Who story, The Crusade. But I will have the last of my reviews of that story up on Saturday the 11th of February. Hopefully, I'll see you on Saturday, or I'll see you on Monday for my next set of reviews. You take care, have a good day, please feel free to like, subscribe, and hopefully leave a tip. And, um, watch out for that tree. Have a good week. Right, some <coughs> excuse me. Right, something I didn't know is that Sonia Walger, Molly Cobb, uh, who is quite definitely my favourite character, she vaguely puts me in mind of Doctor McCoy in Star Trek. Can never resist a Doctor. But at any rate, Sonia Walger, who plays Molly Cobb, is English, which I didn't know, and she does to me a very convincing sounding accent. But that's not why I started to write this footnote. No, I was wondering if the surname Walger, W-A-L-G-E-R, is anything to do with the surname Walger, W-O-O-L-G-A-R. Uh, Walger is apparently German, I'm told, or Wikipedia tells me. And I also know there's an English actor called Jack Walger, W-O-O-L, in the Web of Fear, the Doctor Who story, and I'm just wondering if the names are vaguely related. Uh, my own family name that comes in a Scottish version, my version, which ends in N-I-E, and also comes in an Irish version, an Irish spelling that ends in N-E-Y. If you know about whether the Walger and Walger are connected, please feel free to leave me a comment, either underneath this video or at the bottom of the list in on the blog version of this review. Thank you for bearing with me. Have a very good week.